I'm delighted to cover Jeremy Grantham. In the last year and a half, I've covered him twice, and I'm delighted to do it a third time. He does not give me any interviews, so this is uh, one that he did, and I'll introduce it in a minute. So I'm going to cover that. There's a, he has some significant things to say about the economy and the stock market. And then um, uh, Ted Rossman from Bankrate.com and uh, Dr. Nuriel Rubini and uh, Mike Wilson. We've got, got a lot of material here. Uh, everything very relevant, what's going on right now in the market and in the economy. Hi, I'm Ben Repond. Welcome to my YouTube broadcast. Today is September 26, 2023. I'm going to begin with Jeremy Grantham. This is an interview that he did with uh, David Rubenstein. Um, and he, uh, give you a little background on him if you don't know. Uh, he's the founder, co founder of uh, Grantham, Mayo, and Van Otterloo in Boston. They manage over $100 billion in assets, one of the largest. Uh, asset managers in the world, and uh, he's 84, and he's going strong, very vital. It's awesome. I think he looks great at 84, and um, so, but he's got uh, some significant things to say, and he definitely is uh, going to talk about the what he sees being a macro student of bubbles uh, that we are going to have a recession uh, this next year, and he says deep into 2024. That tells me that it will be prolonged, uh, probably go through the year or close to it. And uh, the, when uh, Rubenstein um, asked him this uh, question, he um, said it could start this year in 2023. So that's what's in front of us. And he says, of course, what goes with that is a decline in asset prices, including the stock market. I would add probably uh, the bond market, which has been crushed, probably uh, will go along with it. Uh, so I think you'll enjoy this. I've pulled out a few clips of the interview uh, to give you what I think are the highlights. And I think you'll enjoy this. Jeremy Grantham. Throughout his five plus decades managing money, Jeremy Grantham has earned a reputation as a bit of a doomsday oracle. The billionaire co-founder of GMO has become famous for predicting financial disaster, most notably by identifying investing bubbles before they pop. Like the dot-com crash in 2000, the financial crisis in 2008, and the tech bubble in 2021. Once in a blue moon every 20 years or so, you'll hit an inflection point that people stop thinking about fundamentals and they just start worrying about how much the stock is going up and are they missing it. And now, Grantham is confident about how things will play out next. We will have a recession running perhaps deep into next year and an accompanying decline in stock prices. You were well known in the investment world for uh, saying that sometimes there are bubbles and bubbles should be avoided. Do you think we're in a major bubble now? At right now in the United States? And do you think that uh, the tech bubble has burst sufficiently so, so that the tech bubble burst is over? I think we are descending from the 2021 bubble, which was one of the great bubbles. And this should be normally the deflationary per period, the deflating period, uh, which is a function of uh, will the earnings uh, decline, will profit margins decline, will the economy go into recession? and we will have a recession running perhaps deep into next year and, a, and an accompanying decline in stock prices. So the recession that you're predicting is probably not going to happen in 2023, but maybe... It may start in 2023. Uh, the Federal Reserve recently said that they think we've uh, kind of uh, cleared the recession uh, hurdle and they don't really project a recession any longer. Right. you disagree with the Fed on that? Yeah, I think the Fed's record on these things is, is wonderful. It's uh, almost guaranteed to be wrong. They uh, have never called a, a recession, and particularly not the ones following the great bubbles. They prided themselves in, in stimulating the bubbles. They took credit for the beneficial effect of, of higher asset prices on the economy. They have never claimed credit for the deflationary effect of asset prices breaking, and they always do. 
Now, you said uh, not too long ago that you weren't a big fan of uh, Jay Powell and the way he's been handling inflation. Uh, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you think he's done a better job recently in getting inflation under control? I think um, it's largely out of his hands. The forces work. I suspect inflation will never be as low as it averaged for the last 10 years, that we have re-entered a period of, of moderately higher inflation and therefore moderately higher interest rates. In the end, life is simple. Low rates push up asset prices, higher rates push asset prices down. And we're now in an era that will average higher rates than we had for the last 10 years. So today, uh, you would say we're likely to go into a recession probably next year, though it could start this year, that the uh, tech bubble burst that we saw beginning, le let's say, last year has not yet completely played itself out. Right. And we have a little mini bubble a bit in artificial intelligence. In a way, not so many. Uh, they were very big moves in a dozen very big stocks. And... Um, well, many, were, and many in the sense that it's not affecting the overall economy as much as the whole tech No, no, that's world right. In, in comparison to 2021 and 1929, it's, so, it's much smaller. So what is it about human nature that makes them feel they want to participate in a bubble? They see the stock market going up and they think they're going to miss something. Even the famous Sir Isaac Newton participated in a bubble yes, he when he thought he was missing something. He mortgaged his house and put all his money into the South Sea Corporation and lost all his money. So even somebody as smart as that is unable to resist the bubble. Why is it that humans can't resist being in bubbles? I always like to say there's nothing more supremely irritating than watching your neighbors get rich. It is just irresistible to try and join in. And uh, when enough people hit the inflection point, it sucks in everybody. And they're, they're the great bubbles. They're the ones that are interesting. Mostly there's a nice balance between bulls and bears and once in a blue moon, every 20 years or so, you'll hit an inflection point where enough people become bullish that people stop thinking about fundamentals. I think of myself as a realist, trying to see the world as it really is and not the way I'd like it to be. Next, um, Tyler Matheson from CNBC interviews Ted Rossman from Bankrate.com, and he covers uh, things like, uh, the two things he covers in particular are um, interest rates, how they affect mortgages and car loans, very significant. And you'll pick this up, it's in the interview, that interest rates have gone from 3% to 7%. What that means in buying a home is, for the same monthly payment, you will be able to buy a home that costs 40% less than you could two years ago, or your payment will be 40% higher. Uh, both are bad news for those trying to buy homes. And um, so, and I don't see, I, I just don't see interest rates coming down very much very soon because they keep saying uh, that they're going to go higher and longer. So uh, not good news for the economy, not good news for people who are buying homes and, and for that matter, cars. It talks about cars being, the average price of a car is $50,000 for a new car. And the payments, of course, the interest rates are up on those as well. The interest rate, the payments are averaging about 800 a month. I, I know there are people who are paying a thousand or more than a thousand dollars, and so buying cars and homes, those are big purchases for us. And those that need uh, loans to do that, um, not good news. Bad news for the economy. Okay, so take a listen to Tyler Matheson and uh, Ted Rossman. Drilling down on housing, the current rate on a fixed 30-year mortgage sitting at 7.3%. Two years ago, that number was 3.03%. To talk about what those rate rises mean, let's bring in Ted Rossman, Senior Industry Analyst at Bankrate. Ted, welcome. Good to have you with us. So that jumped from 3% to above 7%. What does it do uh, to purchasing power for a home buyer. How much does it cut it? It cuts your purchasing power by about 40%. So in other wow. words, if you could afford a $375,000 house at 3%, now with rates over seven, you're probably looking at something like a $225,000 house. And there aren't that many of those. That's another key point is that 
low inventory plus high rates, we're talking high prices, high rates. It's a tough situation. So it's a tough situation. So I, I guess if I were in the market to buy, what I would be doing if I were faced with that dilemma would be looking at adjustable rate mortgages where I can at least buy some time at a lower rate and maybe get into that $375,000 house, even though I would not have the certainty of a 30-year fix. Is that what hap what's happening? Some people are talking about dating the rate and marrying the house, as in you're betting on refinancing down the road. I still think, though, that the 30-year fixed is the best gauge of affordability. I mean, it may not always be the best product for everybody, but it's just a slippery slope. You know, if you're betting mm -hmm. on refinancing and what if that doesn't work out for one reason or another? Rates don't move as expected or you lose your job or you have to move and sell the house. I, I think there's some risk here. Another thing we're seeing is that home builders and sellers are sometimes offering incentives like rate buy downs, for example, to cushion the blow for buyers. Each week, Mike Wilson from Morgan Stanley does an interview. It's a podcast, an Apple podcast. So I'm going to play a clip from it. Uh, he, this came out yesterday. So he's, he's always full of good insights. And he talks about the um, uh, market uh, being overvalued and the degree to which it's overvalued. And the, the issue right now is earnings. Earnings are uh, the price of the stocks in the market, generally speaking, are much higher than the earnings support. So he's, uh, he's been very focused on this for this past year. And he believes that um, prices will have to come down. They've already started to come down, but uh, I think he would make the case that they've got to come down further and that, um, and the consumer, this consumer is being stretched. And so with the consumer being stretched due to inflation and multiple reasons, uh, interest rates, the, um, you know, th this does not spell good news for the market. So, and the economy. So take a listen to Mike Wilson. Welcome to Thoughts on the Market. I'm Mike Wilson, Chief Investment Officer and Chief U.S. Equity Strategist for Morgan Stanley. Along with my colleagues bringing you a variety of perspectives, I'll be talking about the latest trends in the financial marketplace. It's Monday, September 25th at 11 a.m. in New York. So let's get after it. Since mid-July, stocks have taken on a different personality. As we've previously noted, second quarter earnings season proved to be a sell the news event, with the day after reporting stock performance as poor as we've witnessed in over a decade. In retrospect, this makes sense, given weakening earnings quality and negative year-over-year -year growth for many industry groups, coupled with the strong price run-up in the mid-July, which extended valuations. Those valuations continue to look elevated at 18 times earnings, especially given the recent further rise in interest rates and signs from the Fed that it may be adopting a higher-for-longer posture. On that score, the real rate equity return correlation has fallen further into negative territory, signaling that interest rates are an increasingly important determinant of equity performance. Furthermore, one could argue that the post-Fed meeting response from equity markets was outsized for the rate move we experienced. One potential explanation for this dynamic is that the equity market is beginning to question the higher for longer backdrop in the context of a macro environment that looks more late cycle than mid cycle. As discussed over the past several weeks, equity market internals have been supportive of the notion that we're in a late cycle backdrop with high quality balance sheet factors outperforming. Defenses have also resumed their outperformance, while cyclicals have underperformed. The value factor has been further aided by strong performance from the energy sector, while growth has underperformed recently due to higher interest rates. Given our relative preference for defenses, we looked at valuations across these sectors. In terms of absolute multiples, utilities trade the cheapest at 16 times earnings, while staples trade the richest at 19 times. That said, relative to the market in history, utilities and staples still look the cheapest. Both are at the bottom quartile of the historical relative valuation levels, while healthcare relative valuation is a bit more elevated, but still in the bottom 50% of historical relative valuation levels. Overall, valuations remain undemanding for defensive sectors and stocks, which is why we like them. To the contrary, the technicals and breadth for consumer discretionary stocks look particularly challenged right now. We believe this price action is reflecting slower consumer spending trends, student loan payments resuming, rising delinquencies in certain household cohorts, higher gas prices, and weakening demand and data in the housing sector. 
Our economists who avoided making the recession call earlier this year when it was a consensus view see a weakening consumer spending backdrop from here. Specifically, they forecast negative real personal consumption expenditure growth in the fourth quarter and a muted recovery thereafter. Meanwhile, travel and leisure has been a bright spot for consumption, but that dynamic may now be changing to some extent. This appears just about a, a minute and a half. It, it talks about the impact of credit card uh, interest rates. Interest rates are now for credit cards 20% or higher. And for people who carry credit card balances, this is crushing because if you're making a payment, how much of that payment is going to interest and how much is going to principal? People who are struggling to get by on this, it, a, a large portion of what they're paying is probably going to interest. So uh, again, not good news. And there's about a trillion dollars of credit card debt in the US. So this is um, not going away soon. Back in this country, Americans are struggling with the rising cost of everyday items, falling behind in some cases on expenses like car loans and credit cards. Tom Costello is now on the growing economic uncertainty and what you need to know about dealing with debt. From the gas pump to the grocery aisle, inflation continues to take a big bite out of family budgets. In July, personal expenditures jumped another 3.3% from a year ago. We're paying more for pharmaceuticals, recreation, groceries, and clothing. And more Americans are choosing to charge it, though with credit card interest rates at a record 20.6%, many can't pay the bills. And after spending heavily during the pandemic, more than 3.5% of car loan and credit cards are now delinquent. Right now, I have almost $10,000 in credit card debt, so I am so ashamed of that. But, yeah, that's a big number. Dolores Mason Stokes turned to credit cards after being laid off for a second time in nine months. She and her husband are now focusing on cutting costs. Not making more bills, cutting back on cable, all of our streaming services. Despite record levels of credit card debt, Americans continue to spend, up nearly 1% in July from a year ago. So now the question, will the Fed raise rates even more in September as it fights inflation? We will keep at it until the job is done. This, uh, I'll explain this, this tells a story. This is the yield on the long-term government bond, the 30-year government bond. And you may say, well, why does that matter? I'm not buying bonds, okay. But that, look at that pattern, it is going way up. What that means is the price of bonds and bond funds are coming down, down, down. What that means is that those who are in traditional in portfolios, buy and hold 60-40 portfolios, which most people are, that the, the bonds have been crushed. Here's a picture of what the bonds look like. This is the 30-year bond. This is the inverse chart of what I just showed you. The uh, bond, the long-term government bond, is down 52% over this time period. So this would go, uh, let's see, I, I'd say this goes back for, you know, six or seven years, but I'd say a good portion of it is over the last couple of years. So 52% and it, it does not look good. So imagine your portfolio, 40% or 50% of your portfolio being in bonds, which most people are. Now, they may be in the short term or many people are in the intermediate term bond. They're not down as much, but they're down. The pattern looks similar and corporate bonds, the same thing. They look similar. So uh, the use of bonds in portfolios, although traditional financial advisors uh, don't have an alternative to this, they think this is the only way to go. They would say, well, we didn't see this coming. What they mean is they didn't see it coming because there are people who did see it coming. I know I saw it coming three years ago and we took bonds out of our rotation. And um, if I saw it, anybody could see it. So this, why? Because interest rates were at zero. Where are they gonna go? They're gonna go up. What that means is bonds are gonna come down. I didn't know when, I didn't know how far, but I knew they were gonna come down. So that's, um, so that's the bad news on bonds. So if you're in bonds, you feel the pain, I, I'm not gonna give you advice on it. Uh, I can just tell you that um, that approach 
It's an example of why I do not believe in buy and hold portfolios. So, next is Nuriel Rubini, Dr. Rubini. He is a former, uh, he's a retired uh, professor for um, economics from uh, NYU Business School, and you know, excellent economist. And um, he talks about inflation and debt. Inflation. He makes the case that it's probably they, they wanted to. Chairman Powell wants it to come down to two percent. Uh, well, the CPI to come down to two percent, and probably not going to happen. I mean, it would take a lot. It would take a lot of rate increases to get it down. Or and so he says, like many are saying, rates are going to be higher for longer, and um, and. Uh, there is about three, it makes this case, $300 trillion. I can't even get my brain around that. $300 trillion in debt around the world. So you've got the U.S. debt, which is, of course, the government, but the personal debt, corporate debt, local governments, state governments, debt everywhere. And then you go across the, the world, the same thing is everywhere. I don't know about the personal debt, I think the, the U.S. consumer is, um, you know, uses debt a lot more than most countries do. But the, cor the uh, corporate debt and the government debt is, um, it's everywhere. Every, every country or virtually every country has a lot of debt and, and more than they can service. None of them that I know of, any of them that I've looked at, none of them have a plan to pay back one penny of interest or principal. So you know you know when you think about that concept, this is not going to end well. And so when uh, when they talk, when Jeremy Grantham talks about you know a recession and a market decline next year, the weight that's on that, that's pulling it down, in my opinion, is debt. And it could be debt, interest rates, inflation, and all of it. Uh, it all spells a, a contracting economy and a contracting stock market, in my opinion. All of a sudden, we now are trying to comprehend what higher for longer really means. Will that be manifested in the form of dots, or what does it mean for you as you look forward? Well, of course, this week they're not going to hike rates, but whether this is going to be a skip or a pause is to be seen. Skip will be a case in which they don't hike, but then leave it open to hiking maybe in November or later. A pause will be a signal that, no, they're done. I don't think they can say they are done because the economy is still growing above potential. Headline inflation is going higher now that oil prices are going higher and therefore potentially they have to leave the option open that there'll be another hike. What is the most misconceived idea? A lot of people have lived through 5% rates before. You have, I have. I've lived through 15% rates, so have you. Is the greatest disconnect in markets that we are pricing 100 basis points of cuts next year, when the reality is inflation is malingering, core CPI is still tight and hot. What's the greatest misconception about inflation? Uh, you're absolutely right. I think that the markets are still thinking the inflation is going to drop towards 2%, and therefore the Fed is going to cut rate and cut them aggressively. The Fed is pushing back things than you. They're saying we're going to be essentially higher for longer, not just the Fed, but other central banks, there are structural forces that imply that inflation may be higher from deliberalization to aging to geopolitics to other negative supply shocks. And therefore, I think markets are still a little bit uh, too optimistic that the Fed's going to aggressively cut rates starting early next year. That's not going to be the case. At the earliest, Noriel. the Fed is going to start cutting rates maybe towards the middle of the year. Yes. Danny, Danny here in London. Great to speak with you, Noriel. On that point, look, it's a world saddled with $300 trillion worth of debt. If the Fed isn't going to cut as soon as expected, what happens when we hit that maturity wall come next year? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, we live in a world in which there is too much private and public debt. In addition to the official public debt, there is also implicit liability coming from unfunded social security and health care liability coming with aging. And I think that one of the threats, of course, is not just a trade-off that central banks are facing between growth and inflation, but it's actually a trilemma. They have to worry about financial stability. And the more you raise interest rates, 
and the more they go higher on the short end and the long end of the yield curve, the more they're at risk of financial instability. You saw it in what happened in the United Kingdom about a year ago. You saw what happened in the spring of this year with the stresses in the financial system. I don't think we are out of the woods. As rates have to stay higher for longer, the possibility mm. of some degree of financial instability is still with us. The final piece I want to play is a piece from Bloomberg. Um, this man, uh, Seth Harris, he's the Burns Center Senior Fellow and former top advisor to the White House on labor issues. And he talks about the uh, uh, strike. I, I'm playing it because I know that you, you read about, it's in the news quite a bit about the strike and the auto worker strike in uh, Michigan. But the, there, I thought he has a good perspective of what it's going to take to settle the strike. And he looked at kind of the politics of it, and um, and he's a student of this. How, how many votes is it going to take, and what's the likelihood of getting those? So take a listen to this piece from um, Seth Harris. Is this like old-fashioned union action here? I feel like we've seen this movie before, using one company against the other, in this case, Ford. Is that the strategy for Sean Fain? You know, the traditional UAW approach had been to bargain with one company and not the other two, or at a time, there was a time when there were four of them, so the other three. Mm -hmm. um, but the approach this time was to bargain with all three at the same time and to strike against all three at the same time, but to target that strike to a limited number of facilities. And it's still a fairly small number of workers who are striking. There are about 150,000 workers at these three automakers uh, that are UAW members, and only about 18,000 are going to be out on strike with this new 38 plant addition to the strike. So it's the old strategy, but in a new way, in a very innovative way, the UAW adapting a strategy that's been used by the Association of Flight Attendants, for example, in other uh, strikes. Uh, so it's a creative approach, and it seems to be having a desired effect on some of the companies, at least. What gets this actually done, Seth? What number is Sean Fain willing to say, OK, we're going to accept that? You know, uh, the number that matters the most to President Fain is the percentage of his membership at each of the companies that vote to ratify the contract. That's what he is aiming at. He needs a sizable majority of the members, I would argue north of 60 or 65 mm percent, -hmm. voting to ratify the agreement before he will feel that he's been successful. Remember, he won his election by only a few hundred votes out of thousands cast. Um, he wants to pull the union together, and the way to do that is to use these negotiations to do that. So I don't know what wage number, what COLA number, what temporary worker arrangement is necessary. I think they're going to have to get rid of the two tiers to get that kind of support. But different groups of workers want different things. It's not a homogeneous group. And they need different things. You know, you know, newer workers have some demands. Older workers or longer-term workers have other demands. And he's got to feed all of those to get to a big number for ratification. Remember the Teamsters? 83% ratification with the UPS contract. No, no. Stay on. Everybody ready to go again? Well, the stock market is a volatile place. And there's risk in the stock market. We do our best to take that risk out or at least reduce it as much as we can. Uh, by doing that, we actually exited the market uh, in all of our portfolios last uh, Friday. Um, and uh, I don't know what's in front of us, but our indicator said, get out. So we got out. And, um, but that doesn't mean it's free from volatility or free from risk. And some people are feeling it more than others. Uh, but um, anyway, <laughs> I thought it, it was a... Uh, Good depiction of, uh, of the market. Okay, well, thank you for watching. If you have questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. Thank you.